Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. And I'm really uh, impressed to see so many people want to talk about sex first thing in the morning. <laughs> um, so I've titled this talk, Thriving. Um, and let's, let's go ahead and talk about it. Um, and I'm hoping uh, that this will be interactive. Uh, I've actually given permission to, well, I don't know why that's funny, but. <laughs> I've given uh, permission to our moderator that if there are questions of the audience, I will break the talk, and we can actually talk about any questions you guys have as we discuss this. So first things first, my conflicts of interest, I obviously am not being paid by any studio, pharma drug company, to talk about sex and intimacy. And here's your first task of the day. I would like you to rearrange these letters and form words. <laughs> Count of five. And I think, OK, there are no kids in the room. Count of five. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So did you get spine and subtext? <laughs> OK, I didn't either the first time I did it. All right. So now that you're all relaxed, OK. Let's go ahead and talk about this. And the biggest question, I kind of mentioned this yesterday, um, even among oncologists, I get this a lot, sort of, you know, why would you see patients with metastatic disease in your clinic? Do metastatic, does, doesn't anyone with metastatic disease, aren't they more concerned about just living? Do they actually have sex? <laughs> so when I was at the Mass General, I started the oncology sexual health clinic there. The place had been around for 50 years. They didn't have that program until I mentioned maybe it might be a good idea, Comprehensive Cancer Center, to offer this. So they did it. And one of the first patients I met was a woman named Elaine. She was diagnosed with a lobular carcinoma of the breast in 2004. She did five years of tamoxifen at that time. And she was fine. And then she developed abdominal pain and bloating and a scan showed carcinomatosis on her abdomen. For all intents and purposes, it looked like she had ovarian cancer. So she went to the operating room at that point, and they did a biopsy, and it wasn't ovarian cancer. It was metastatic lobular carcinoma. And it was spread all over her abdomen. They didn't resect anything. They just closed her up, said you had metastatic lobular carcinoma involving your bowels. You should see a medical oncologist. Um, she woke up being told she had metastatic disease. They showed her pictures of it. And the first thing she thought about is, look how beautiful that is. Look at it. It's like these specks of light. It looks like pearls in my abdomen. It was the shock of knowing nine years after the diagnosis, you're telling me I've developed metastatic disease. So what did she do? Um, so that was in 2013. She was put on letrozole, and she had a CR. She went to complete remission. Yep. But she also was on letrozole, and she was in complete misery about it. Uh, and for her, it wasn't the arthralgias and the muscle pains that got her. It was the fact that she could not wear jeans and be comfortable because her vulva was so chafed. She could not have intercourse because she was so dry. And it seemed to her that as her tumor markers and her scans improved, the quality of her life was getting worse and worse. But she decided she wouldn't give up. She was not going to suffer the, the side effects of letrozole and just take it. She was not just going to live. It was very much important to her and her husband to maintain a sexual relationship. And unfortunately for her, she had to do all the work first, which means her docs didn't know how to help. So she tried over-the-counter lubricants without success. Um, she saw a gynecologist who prescribed over-the-counter lubricants, which she had already done. She saw a gynecologic nurse who basically said, I have no idea what you're talking about or how to help you. So she went on the web, and this is now 2000. 16 and found my clinic. She was not referred by her doc, her nurse, anybody in her clinic cancer center. She found my clinic. Um, and because of that, 
this is the point I want, you, I want to make for you. You define what's important in your life. You communicate what that is to your partner, to your family, your significant other, and to your doctor. And if your medical team doesn't know where to go, sometimes you do have to do your own research. Because sexual health, and what I'm, I'm hoping also in part for all of us, sexual health is not just about an act. It's not about intercourse. It's about intimacy, sensuality. It's about body image and arousal, desire, climax. And it's about being satisfied. So this talk will not only be about how to have penetrative intercourse. It's going to be about the whole gamut of sexual health for women and for men. So here's your true or false question. After a diagnosis, sexual health in men and women is impacted in a very similar way. True, some false. All right, cancer affects men and women as severely, but it is expressed very differently. This is male sexual health. Okay. And if, you've, if you have no, anybody who has a prostate cancer, oftentimes if that switches off, they don't want to hug, and they don't want to kiss, and they don't want to touch, because what's the point? This is female sexual health. Right? There is no on and off switch for women. There's lots and lots of circuits. And this is why it's so difficult to communicate needs. This is why it's so difficult to have a conversation, because where the hell do you start talking about this? This is where I generally will ha take women to start. This is Rosemary Basson's model for female sexual health. It was actually geared towards women in the general public, but most women in your community who have had a diagnosis of cancer endorse this. Essentially, it starts from the top. A woman who is sexually neutral, so in their teens, you know, if you're lucky, younger, all right, what wakes them up to discover, um, I think I want something more in my life, is that want of intimacy. That, that's the seed that sort of starts sprouting. And that intimacy leads to the discovery that certain areas of your body, when touched, are sensitive. And in fact, not only are they sensitive, you get aroused by that. And it's that arousal that can help awaken desire. And when desire is satisfied, the circle propagates. Okay. So what is missing from this model of female sexual health? What's missing is intercourse. Okay. So the connection between desire and satisfaction for women has nothing to do with any one act at all. It does, it's not important. This is why I sometimes we'll um, kid with my own patients. It's like, if you ever wondered why you were more aroused when he did your dishes <laughs> than when he was touching your back, this is why. Okay? Women are grounded in intimacy, and the desire to satisfaction need not be any singular thing you do in your bedroom or your kitchen table. <laughs> but what I will tell you is that we are now learning men can be just as complicated after a diagnosis of cancer. And I do this, I'm, exp I'm showing you this slide in purpose. It's really not fair to men to say we're on and off switches, particularly after you've been diagnosed with cancer and if your loved one has cancer. This is a model of male and female sexual health that I came up with, actually, with um, Ann Katz, who, by the way, is giving a webinar on April 25th for LBBC on the same topic. So we named this the Katz Adizon model for men diagnosed with cancer. And essentially, it shows that not only is the body important to sexual performance, but now after cancer, you're dealing with side effects. So it's almost this yin and yang, this pull that leads, that is interfacing and making sexual performance either a good one or a bad one. You have your sex drive, and that's driven by society. That's the on and off switch, we, which we as men grow up thinking it's all about erections. That's the message society has given to us, that male virility is tied to erectile function. But look in the very end, that, that bottom circle. The partner is inherently important 
to men as well as women, that level of communication can either dampen a man's function sexually, but it can also enhance it. So again, we are now trying to broaden our idea of male sexual health. I can tell you most, of, most men who come to see me in this clinic their first, second, third, fourth, fifth visits about this topic have always been about erections. All right. And um, I think that's been, we've been unfair. So the other concept that's come up recently is this concept of breast specific sensuality. This is work from Jennifer Goss. And she wondered what role the breast played in women diagnosed with cancer, who then went on to have a lumpectomy, mastectomy, Race, uh, reconstruction radiation. And what you're seeing here is that before surgery, it was a universal phenomenon. Women, their, their breasts, their chest wall was the, was the location of stimulation. It was inherently important to most women to get in the mood. But after surgery, you lose it lumpectomy with radiation, mastectomy, and even with reconstruction, there's a loss of sensuality. And what's interesting, if you look at the women who did not have reconstruction, that's mastectomy without reconstruction, that's the MRM, they, were, they felt that loss most acutely. All right? And what was interesting, it was tied to how satisfied they were surgically. Now, if you compare just the two groups who were seem to be similarly um, impacted by breast surgery, those women who had a lumpectomy, those women who had a mastectomy with reconstruction, just look at that purple part. Even years later, the breast ceases, or the chest wall, it ceases to be a part of sensuality for 40% of you. Okay. So it's unclear to me in the very complicated discussion that all women have to go through of lumpectomy, mastectomy, reconstruction, how this information could either help or confuse the issue of breast surgery. But for women who have the choice, it might be helpful to know this. It is not something we've talked about. This is the other issue, is that 20% of patients, regardless, lumpectomy or reconstruction with mastectomy, 20%, when you touch their chest or breast, it's painful. Okay? And this, again, is not something couples discuss. So I have a, a, a few patients of mine who, would, who used to be take off their shirt, lights as bright as this light, and they, you know, their breasts were there to be touched. After surgery, never in the light, never without my shirt on. This is no man's land, don't even think of touching it. And a lot of men in that situation have accepted that that's a boundary, but they don't understand why. Okay. So there's a lot that we have to communicate about, and this is why when I see patients, I have them bring in their partner as much as possible, whether they be in a same-sex or heterosexual relationship. So for women, what do we do? So we find all these issues. How can we actually help? I want you to think about the vagina and the vulva as an inherent part of you, obviously, but it's not just a sexual organ. All right? So if you think of vaginal health and sexual health as a separate thing, we can treat both areas. But in terms of the sexual health, these are things you want to do at the time you want to have an activity. Vaginal health are things that you need to adopt as part of your beauty regimen. And I'm going to go into some of these. So the new term for vaginal atrophy, vulvovaginal um, dryness, is GSM, genital urinary menopause. So you might hear that term more common. And I'll just refer to it as GSM. The first step that I believe is important is to utilize a vaginal moisturizer. And the concern I've always had is that people don't know how often, they don't know how to use it. My advice, four to five times a week. All right? And you can use it one hour before intercourse. Now, there are multiple types of vaginal moisturizers. The one that's most studied is polycarbophilic base. That's um, Replens. 
that one was shown to be as effective <clears throat> as even estrogen in uh, uh, re uh, restoring uh, lubrication and restoring your pH. Um, for patients who want a more natural course, vitamin E can be used. You can actually use a natural oil like coconut or olive oil externally on the vulva. We don't, tech, we don't like to recommend that for use as a moisturizer in the vagina. Uh, and then for those who want to try something but are really worried about estrogenic properties, and we'll get to that in a moment, there's a formulation called Luvina, which is parabens free, which you can use as a moisturizer. The added benefit with Luvina, it can also be used as a lubricant. Moisturizers, though, are not lubricants. Moisturizers are about vaginal health. You moisturize your face on a daily basis. That's what I'm recommending we, you do in your vagina and the vulva. There's something called vaginal laser therapy. I'm sure some of you have heard about this. Uh, it's being marketed as Mona Lisa Touch. So vaginal laser therapy is carbon dioxide laser treatments to the vaginal vault. Okay. Um, there, the data on this is incredibly limited. Uh, so most of this data is in women with GSM who are postmenopausal, but were not cancer survivors at all. But it did show improvements in function and in quality of life 12 weeks after you did it. The data in women after breast cancer is even more limited. All of this seems to be coming out of Italy. But you know, of, of interest is that, that last bullet here. So among women on an aromatase inhibitor who had vaginal laser therapy, they saw improvements in vaginal function that lasted out to 11 months. So there's actually some studies going on with this vaginal laser therapy for patients on an aromatase inhibitor. And I think one is going to open nationally through one of the cooperative groups soon. What about hormones? OK, so we, there was a little bit of a discussion about estrogen for women who have metastatic breast cancer or advanced breast cancer, taking letrozole, taking tamoxifen. What's the role of vaginal hormones? It's, a very, it's complicated insofar as two things. Vaginal therapies are aimed at being local treatment into the vagina. Local meaning it doesn't show up in your bloodstream by any big degree. However, be cognizant that there are vaginal preparations that are actually systemic treatments. So the doses are higher than you would think just for a vaginal treatment. And these, these can complicate matters. But in the bottom line, the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology, ASCO, the Society of Clinical Oncology, Cancer Care Ontario, we've all come to the same conclusion. There's no data at all that estrogen locally applied into the vagina has any impact on breast cancer outcomes. Okay, So these are considered safe. They are not considered the frontline treatment. We want to go non-hormonal approaches first. But if you are suffering, vaginal estrogen is actually OK. There's a drug called ospemaphine, which is on the market. This is a vaginal serum. So it's, a, it's tamoxifen, but instead of eating or ingesting it, you put it into your vagina. It's actually approved for women who are postmenopausal. The important thing to note, we have no idea if this is effective. And that's my point. I don't know if it's effective in women treated for breast cancer. I don't think there's a risk with this, because it's essentially a CIRM. But um, it has this warning on the FDA label that it has not been studied in women with breast cancer, and it shouldn't be used in that group. Interestingly, in Italy, this is their go-to, is osfina, or, or uh, ospemaphine. There's also something called DHEA, which is another um, steroid. This is a, 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 an androgen, dehydroepiandrosterone. This was also tried against placebo for women and was shown to be effective as well. Some debate in your breast oncologists because of the progesterone receptor on breast cancer cells and unclear whether or not this might stimulate progesterone receptors. What we do know, and this is the only thing we know about these DHA preparations, it doesn't increase your, your estrogen levels in the bloodstream. So going from these hormones, going from things for vaginal health, then we can talk about sexual comfort. And I'm going to presume for, for a lot of this, this is about how do I make penetration easier? OK. So the first step is you should always use a vaginal lubricant. 
okay? And you apply it on yourself, but you apply it on your partner, or you'd apply it on the toy you're using. Um, there are two types, water and silicone-based. The silicone-based lubricants tend to stay slicker for longer, but they will stain your sheets, okay? In terms of preferences, <laughs> in terms of preferences, they seem to be about the same. There's one study out there that showed if you were doing penile anal intercourse, women preferred water-based lubricants. That's the only difference I was able to find. So either of them are okay, but if they get too sticky or tacky with a water-based lubricant or you don't want to reapply because it breaks up rhythm, try a silicone-based lubricant. It tends to, again, it lasts a bit longer. What about olive oil? Can you use olive oil as a lubricant? There's one study out there that says you, sh you can. It's a very small study of 25 women. It was part of a program that had pelvic floor rehab. Um, <clears throat> they were using a vaginal moisturizer, and they were using olive oil. But of those 25 women in that bottom line, 73% really liked the olive oil. Okay. Some concern, again, debate in our field, is that the olive oil can go rancid inside a vagina which is why they don't recommend its use. I've never seen a rancid vagina from someone who's been using olive oil. <laughs> I don't want to see it either, but, but, you know, so I talk about it with them. But there are some patients who really don't want to use chemicals. You know, at least I can point to this very small study that said, you know, we tested it, it's been done, you could try it, okay? There's also, so this is the biggest breakthrough though. If you're having pain with penetration, okay, you need to have a pelvic exam. So pain with pelvic, uh, I used to think the pain came in because the vagina is spasming around a penis, okay, or, or a, a, a dildo, right? And the reason it's spasming is because you might have some dryness or it might be very thin and the muscle of the vagina is clamping down to try to protect itself. If this is happening to you, know two things. When your partner tells you to relax, your vagina will not relax. <laughs> and when you tell your vagina to relax, your vagina will not relax, okay? So you cannot control vaginal spasm mentally. You can't breathe through it, it's not childbirth, okay? Your vagina is spasming and it's it's almost, um, it's a protective mechanism is what I call it, all right? So there's a second type though that I, I've just recently started to, to um, do exams for. And at the opening of the vagina, that's called the vestibule, all right? And for a lot of women, I'll hear this story. It's all great and then he tries RME and it's immediately painful and I, he just has to stop or it, it can go no further. That's a key that it might not be the vagina that's spasming. The source of pain might be the vestibule. And that's called vestibular tenderness. And all you do is you take either, well, I would either take a cotton swab or I just use my finger and I try to widen the, vagina, the, the vestibule. And women can be, I can reproduce the pain that they have in the bedroom with this. If that's what you have, I could fix it in 24 hours. So this is the study from Martha Getch from OHSU. She did a randomized trial of 46 women who had breast cancer. And she, half of that group used aqueous lidocaine. 4% aqueous lidocaine. It comes as a solution. The other group got placebo. And what she told women to do is you take a cotton ball, you saturate that cotton ball, and you place it right on the vestibule, not inside the vagina. You don't paint the clitoris. You just stick it right in the, the vestibule for three minutes. And she assessed whether they were able to have satisfying sexual events. And they were. In fact, that last line, 20 women were abstinent because it hurts so much. 17 of them were able to have intercourse comfortably with the use with the use of a simple solution. Yes. Yes, so I was just gonna you you prompted. So I planted her here just to ask that question. <laughs> so that is the that is the one concern that, that patients have. It's like so if my vestibule is numb, will I still orgasm? Um, what about my partner? Will he be able to feel things? The answer is 
no one on this study complained about penile numbness. So it's such a dilute solution. It's locally applied and absorbed quickly that once you guys have intercourse, there is no effect on the male. And as long as you are not putting it all the way inside and completely bypassing the vestibule, and as long as it is not painting over your external vagina and to the vulva, it's actually quite effective. And it's one of the most satisfying things I can see is when women are able to say, I was able to have sex for the first time. So this whole concept of use it or lose it that Elaine mentioned, throw it out the window. That is not true, okay? If you have vestibular tenderness and you haven't used it in a while, it, it is not lost. Now, if you have vaginismus, which is that vaginal spasm, which comes after sort of a long-standing um, uh, attempts to have intercourse, um, or it might even have predated your cancer, where sex was always very painful, and you gritted your teeth through it, that might be because the vagina is spasming. This will not fix vaginal spasm, all right? This is the treatment for vaginal spasms. These are vaginal dilators. Now, the ones on the left, they kind of look like candles, and they feel like candles. They're that hard and cold. The ones on the right are made out of silicone, so they're, they're flexible, plus they also have a head on them. And I think the head is important because the vestibule um, needs to stretch to accommodate a head of a penis before it takes the shaft. So the ones on the right are one of the ones I, I uh, provide my patients. And again, here the instructions are also really important. This is not a test. This is not a game to see how quickly you can get to the largest size. And the, the image I would put in your mind is think of trying to get your vagina to trust you again, OK? And you do that with time, and you do it very patiently. So you take the smallest one, which is this one here. And essentially what you do is you hold it at the shaft, and you insert only until your vagina tells you don't go further, OK? And if you start to experience that pain, you back off a little bit, and you hold it there count to 30, and then you walk away. You wash it up, put it away, go on with your day, or go to sleep at night. And essentially what happens, and it takes weeks, maybe months, is that your vagina will accommodate a dilator. And it'll accommodate dilators of gradual size, provided you are patient with it. Okay? And essentially what I, what I tell patients is you want to get to at least the medium size before you aim to have penetrative intercourse again. And then you should try to accommodate this as part of play. So your husband or your partner um, will know how to insert inside of you. Okay? Let this be a guide. All right? So this, not need, this need not be something you do in your own private time. But again, whatever is most comfortable for you and your partner is what you should be doing. There's a drug called flibanserin that's on market. It's a desire drug. <clears throat> so the approval was premenopausal women who the history is, I can have intercourse, and it's great when I'm doing it, and I can have an orgasm, and it's all, it's all very nice. But I don't care if I ever do that again. <laughs> so the feedback's gone. So the desire is satisfying, but the circle's not propagating. So that does happen. It's a hypoactive sexual desire disorder. That is a known syndrome. This drug is aiming to um, alleviate that syndrome. What's interesting to me is I just learned that the prefrontal cortex is where phlebanserin seems to have its effect. The prefrontal cortex is where most of the chemo brain is localizing to. So maybe. If you take this drug, you'll have less chemo brain. That's actually a study I'm proposing. But um, the FDA indication is in premenopausal women, the most, the most common side effects is low blood pressure and a risk of passing out. Okay. Um, now, the reason why you probably haven't heard of this drug, phlebanserin, 
is because it's, it's very difficult to order. I had to take a course to prescribe it. Your pharmacy has to be to give it to you. And I think nationally, Walgreens is the ones that can prescribe phlebanserin to you. And you have to take a test as well and sign an agreement. So as part of the development of this drug, they took 20 men, first thing in the morning, and had them drink liquor, <laughs> like three or four drinks. And then they gave them phlebanserin. And the question was, will this make you pass out? There is an interaction with alcohol, especially if you're a man drinking first thing in the morning and then taking this drug. <laughs> okay. But because they saw that interaction with alcohol, I need to tell you, while you're on this drug, you cannot drink liquor. You need to agree, I will not drink liquor while I take this drug. And your pharmacist needs you to sign it as well. They have made it possible <laughs> to, to give this drug out to women. Hopefully they'll resolve that issue, but I'm actually trying to design a study for women uh, with breast cancer for flavasterin to, to help treat desire. Um, and we'll see if the FDA lets us do it. What about um, those PDE5 inhibitors that work so well with men that they take it 10, 10 minutes before and they're ready to go? They don't seem to work in women. There's one caveat, though, is that if you are taking an antidepressant and your um, sexual health has diminished because you have been on this drug, these drugs may work for you, the PDE5 inhibitors. But the dosing active are the dosing that we use in men. Because one of these formulations has a female formulation, which is about half the dose in men. You actually need the full dose. So that's the only caveat here. But in general, it doesn't really work. What about testosterone? We know that testosterone works in most women who are postmenopausal. If they had a hysterectomy, but not for cancer, and those women who have a desire problem. So the question for us is, does testosterone's benefits <laughs> outweigh the risks of taking testosterone? So there was actually a clinical trial that looked at testosterone versus placebo in women treated for cancer. It did not work. So in four weeks, there was no difference at all to the female sexual function scores of women. And even when they did the crossover, so first four weeks you took placebo, next four weeks you take the testosterone, or vice versa, there was no impact at all on this. This data we have, so at this point, I would not recommend we try testosterone, although I will tell you it is being actively studied. So just going on to uh, men with metastatic breast cancer, just because I wanted to cover this just briefly, recognizing just for men that there is erectile dysfunction, but there are other forms of dysfunction that happen as well. There's sexual bother, which is when a man can perform, and it's all great, and you're as the receptive partner is like, boy, that was wonderful. He might not think so. That bother can be really significant. All right. There's also issues with ejaculation and orgasm, and also with men with prostate cancer or even testicular cancer. Changes in penile length have been reported from, from these for gents. But for men with metastatic breast cancer, there's something that you should look into called penile rehabilitation. So penile rehabilitation is how we try to address erectile dysfunction. But importantly, so a lot of what I describe for women is like what women can do to help. For men, you bring them in with their partner from the get-go, OK? Because the breaks in intimacy are, are pretty much tied to the lack of erection. Some of that feedback that goes into that, that psychological feedback that men need, needs to come from engagement with their partner. PDE5 inhibitors do work incredibly well. There's two ways to take them, though. So you can take it when you want to have sex, or you can take it as a low dose continuous variable where you're trying to normalize the flow to the penis. These are things you can discuss with your doctor. Healthy lifestyle is incredibly important. Okay, so we, there was a lot of talk about nutrition. Exercise is really important for men who have sexual health problems. And then habits, alcohol and smoking predominantly. 
can, can, can be very, um, can have a very negative impact. And then realize, and this is eye-opening for some, but men do not need an erection to achieve an orgasm, okay? So some men have looked at me and like, well, how does that work? I was like, well, I'm not going to show you, but <laughs> I was like, you know, the head of the penis is essentially just like the clitoris, all right? And if you, if with enough stimulation, men can achieve an orgasm. And if you're on his side just clapping away, that might be great, okay? So sex in the face of metastatic disease, this is my advice to you guys. Ask yourself and your partner, like I did yesterday, what is intimacy? What does that mean to me? What does it mean to you? And then, what does that mean to us, okay? When I asked men who had prostate cancer the question, what is intimacy? No one in that group of 16 could define intimacy without using sex or intercourse in their answer. When I did the same thing in women in multiple settings about intimacy, closeness, holding hands on the couch, just kissing, walking in the park, it were these private, intimate moments that women were describing as intimacy. Getting on the same page is about what you're looking for for intimacy is part of the challenge, but it can be very satisfying. Um, remembering that even though um, both of you want to have not only successful intercourse or a successful activity, but enjoyable, take that as the benchmark for pleasure being the goal. It's not performance. No one's going to give you a gold star if you take painful intercourse. No one's going to give you that gold star if it's taking you, it took you four hours, but you reached that orgasm. Okay? No one's going to give you those kudos. You're going to give those kudos to yourself. So make pleasure the goal, not the performance. And then homework is always important as well. So what does, that, what does this mean? Intimacy exercises, I'll talk a little bit about sensate focusing. Communication in a very, in a very uncomfortable way at first. But that whole technique I talked about yesterday of I want, I wish, you know, these kinds of things, phrasing it in the first person rather than saying, you're not doing this right, or I wish you would do this for me. No, I wish I could have sex comfortably. I wish I didn't bleed when I had sex. I want to hold your hand, okay? That's really important, and it puts all the responsibility back on you so you can work out things together. So sensei focusing is a way towards intimacy, and essentially what it is is play. And that's the word I always will use, because men have a hard time kind of considering what intimacy exercises are. Because, And I learned this in the beginning when I was doing this. I would tell partners, go home and practice intimacy. They'd come back mad <laughs> like three weeks later. It's like, you said intimacy. I was like, yes, I did. He said you said intercourse. I was like, well, is that what he heard? He's like, no, that's what you said. So the man was like, you said intercourse. I was like, no, 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 I said intimacy. So just to avoid all that, it's about play. Play is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be lighthearted, right? So I'd say, if this is an issue, go home and play. Sensate focusing will allow you to do that in a structured way. So in stage one, both of you get naked. Uh, this works for same-sex couples and, and heterosexual couples. Both of you get naked. You sit across from each other. You don't talk. And you take turns touching each other. Okay? Uh, but you avoid the genitals and you avoid the chest. All right? And this is important because um, something was said yesterday about how you know, the breasts are not your only erogenous organ. This is how you can discover what feels good now. Okay, so that's stage one. Stage two, you start at stage one, but then you can touch anywhere. Okay, no forbidden zones. However, for both stage one and two, you cannot have an orgasm, and you cannot have intercourse. This is play. You're trying to learn to play. And for women who have avoided um, any kind of intimacy because they know all roads lead to intercourse, because we all have patterns, right? This is a way to break the patterns. Right, so stage one, go to stage two, touch anywhere, one at a time. 
Stage three, you mutually touch. Okay, you touch each other anywhere you want. You don't have sex. Um, uh, if one of you or both of you have an orgasm, that's okay. All right. And then stage four, you position yourself so your bodies are touching. So you're not using your hands any longer. Your bodies are actually in physical contact. And if it feels right, then you go ahead and have intercourse. Okay? It's about rediscovery because this is the new you. And the new you might change every six months, depending on where you are with your treatments. Okay? It's important to try to rediscover you, yourselves in a comfortable way where both of you understand what the rules are and you're not having to mention, remember, stage one, all right? You can't, you can't have sex with me, just to be clear. It's, this is all written down. The doc gives you the paperwork. See, stage one. <laughs> all right? Again, it's all about touching. It's not about talking. So I'll conclude here. So the first is, uh, when it comes to sexual health and intimacy, you need to communicate. This is your body. This is your life. We are wrecking your lives on purpose because we are trying to treat your cancer. But you do not have to sacrifice that life. So if you communicate with us, we should. We have a responsibility to provide you some answers. Just like you come to us with nausea, expecting us to take away your nausea, you need to demand a better sex life from your doctors. All right. The second is consult. So if you're in a, in a place where the, the um, expertise isn't there, there are resources. I actually helped LBBC with their book for um, sexual, sexuality and intimacy in the face of metastatic disease. Those resources exist. Um, advocacy organizations can contact folks. You know, if, you, if you'd like to, you can always email me, and I'll try to point you towards a direction. And then there's that internet space called Will to Love, which is, again, doing a study through the American Cancer Society that is not only just education counseling, it's embedded in videos, so you can actually see what people actually talked about. But Dr. Shover <clears throat> has also built in a psychotherapeutic model where you can actually access a psychotherapist for sexual health. The third is to compromise. So at the best case scenario, six months from now, all of you will be having a very satisfying sex life, however you define that. For some, it won't happen. All right? The sexual life you want is not something that you can have anymore. Maybe it's because you have bone metastases and it's too uncomfortable to lay flat in bed, and you just can't negotiate positions. Maybe it's because you know, the pills just make you so nauseous, it kills any desire. And even as much as you want that, you just can't get over the nausea. All right? This is where compromise comes in. Okay? And I should say also, for the caregivers out there, not uncommon for your view of your partner to change. Where you're seeing your wife or your husband get sick with chemotherapy and you're mopping up the floor, you know, all these things. The saddest thing to me is when the patient wants a sexual relationship, but her partner sees a patient, all right? Recognize that's a reality for some of you. It doesn't have to be that way, all right? This is that point where you can also seek help, seek that compromise. Okay, well, you know, I just can't get erect, you know, after you just got out of the hospital. I just can't perform that way. But why don't we just sit here and hold hands for a bit? All right? Compromise. It doesn't have to be your lifelong compromise, but it's compromises at that time. And then be clear. What is it you want? What is it you need? What is it you wish for? So those are the three things I try to tell people. You know, it's sort of just have that conversation. What do you want right now? What do you need? Because it might not be the same thing. And what do you wish for? All right? That's that goal that you guys can navigate through this whole journey. It's very difficult. But you can do it as a couple that way. All right? If you know what you guys are looking at and looking for. 
Because after cancer, everyone deserves a sex life. And that includes the young adult. So those of you who have 18-year-olds who have cancer, they deserve their sex lives. The older patient does. Just because a woman's in her nursing home doesn't mean that she's not sexually active. Okay. <laughs> patients in relationships absolutely deserve to have this intact. But patients without a partner absolutely deserve the option to find one if that's what they want. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer patients should be included in these discussions. And you, anyone with advanced or metastatic disease deserves this. And so does your oncologist. <laughs>